So uh, mean median mode, again, are measures of central location and uh, they have different pros and cons. We're not gonna get into that in this class, but most people would lean on mean, AKA average versus uh, median or mode. But historically, if you're using data that's considered normally distributed, so you might've seen a bell curve before that helps identify that. So if you've seen this shape before, mean, median, and mode are all at the middle. So they should, it shouldn't, they should all be the same theoretically, but they may not be. But I'll show you the techniques to find all these. Those ones you probably have seen before. Hopefully you're comfortable with that. If not, that's okay. Uh, hopefully you'll be comfortable with it after the fact. Funny that you're asking about uh, your actual grade being weighted total. Uh, we, I can show you how to calculate that manually um, with the techniques that we're learning in this, this lecture. Then we'll talk about frequency distributions. This is useful uh, not only for finding the weighted average, but also for identifying kind of the, the whether something's happening often or not happening often. So you can have a better understanding of whether you should take it seriously or not. We can identify data through graphs. So you're probably familiar with bar graphs, pie charts and things like that, but it doesn't hurt to, to go over it. Um, and then price relatives, I call them indices. So indexes. That is something that definitely is applicable to uh, macroeconomics. So if you ever take Econ 101A, uh, whether it's in the winter semester or beyond, we'll definitely be using that. Uh, measurements of dispersion. Uh, this says optional because the book treats it as optional, but I don't treat anything as optional in this class um, outside of making it extra credit. Um, we can talk about measurements of variance or dispersion range, standard deviation. I give you a couple of Standard deviation problems on the homework. Those are the most sophisticated problems that you'll have. I think you won't have too much of a problem doing the rest of it, but the um, standard deviation is a little labor intensive. So, um, but if it's for extra credit, why not throw it on there? So terminology, how do we separate mean, median, and mode? Well, mean is average. So um, I'm sure you may be familiar with that, but if I say mean, it means average. So arithmetic just means that you're doing some division, addition and division using arithmetic. All you do to find it is you add up all of your observations. So your data is observations. So you might have like, Observation one is five, observation two is 10, observation three is seven. Well, the number of values is how many observations you have. You have one, two, three. So you're dividing by three and the numerator is the sum. So five, 10, seven, 22. 22 over three is 7.33. So that would be your mean. Median is finding the middle observation of the data. So when I was in law school, I was actually the median student when I graduated. There was 99 people in my graduating class. There was 49 people above me, 49 people below me, and then here was me in the middle. Me. I was me, D end. I was the median. So 49 people had a GPA above me, 49 had a GPA below me, and I was smack dab in the center. I thought it was neat as a stats nerd.
and who says finishing in the middle of your class means that you can't do anything in life. Boom. So it doesn't matter if you're top, bottom, middle of your class, as long as you work hard and strive. I was way below the middle of my class in, in high school. Uh, I forgot how many people ranked above me in, in high school. It was astronomical because I had a large graduating class and I didn't do very well. So, uh, so these numbers don't necessarily predispose you to any sort of level of success, but we use these numbers in terms of a bunch of different types of calculations. But basically it's finding the center of the data. How many people are below, uh, how many observations, doesn't have to be people, how many observations are above, how many observations are below. And then uh, the mode is the value that occurs most often. So median is center, mean is average, mode is most often frequent. So finding mean again is the sum of all values. If you've ever seen this sigma symbol before, it means add everything together. So typically you'll see this as your, uh, whoops, You'll see something like this sometimes as mean. So X is whatever the data is. I is the number of number of observations. So if you have 10 observations, uh, observation one is X1, observation two is X2, N is gonna be the number of observations. So if you had 10, this would be 10. And then you just add them all together. That's what the Sigma means. So, for this example, uh, Bill found that the uh, average daily sales were $115.14. Um, and Bill wanted to know how he found 150.14. And so what he did was he took an average. So on Sunday, Bill made 400. Monday, Bill made 100. Tuesday, Bill only made 68. Wednesday, Bill made 115. Thursday, Bill made 120. Friday, Bill only made 68. And Saturday, Bill made 180. So if you add all these together, you get, oh, I don't know, whatever 114 times seven is. Let's see here. 568 plus 115 plus 120 plus 68 plus 180, 1,051. You take 1,051 divided by seven, you get $150.14 rounded to the nearest cent. That's all you do. We could find the median. So to find the median, which is the next slide from, I don't know if it's using the same, no, it's using different data. It's using different data. So let's find the median. So the median is the middle value. So to find that, you want to put these in ascending order. So the smallest number is 68. Oops. Then we have another 68. Then we have 100. Then we have 115, 120, 180. Whoopsies, I don't know how I accidentally muted myself, but hopefully it wasn't for too long. So there's seven observations. So there's three below, three above. So 115 is our median. So our mean was 11514. Our median is 115. What's our mode? Mode is the observation that's occurred most often. So what is our mode? What number occurs most often? So 68, yeah. 
68 occurs twice, the rest only occur once, so our mode is 68. So these are supposed to be measurements of a central location, but you get three significantly different answers. Median is in the middle, mode is way on the left, and mean is right here somewhere. So this is why even though in some instances they could be the same number, you might wanna calculate them differently or calculate them all individually to see kind of how variable the data might be, which is what that dispersion measurement at the end of today's lecture refers to. So let's find the mean of a group. So if we wanna find the average salary of these employees, I don't know why it says mean value, it should be the mean salary. How much are you worth? So salary. So Alice makes 95,000, Jane makes 27, Joel makes 32, Jane, the other Jane <laughs> makes 67 and Bill makes 40. So if you add all these together, you get, well, that's 107. This is 59 plus 95, which would be 154. So you're getting 261,000 divided by five, which gives you 52,000, we put you at 260,000 divided by five is 200. So yeah, $52,200. Just adding up the observations and dividing it by the number of observations that you have. There's no mode in this set and the median would be 40,000. So this is why there's always a debate about what is better, mean, median, or mode. Mode is usually the least reliable. Uh, a lot of people prefer median over mean because you could have skewed data. So notice in this example, in this example, the mean, was quite a bit higher than the median. Or, yeah, the median. Median was only 40 grand here. Mean was 52,000. Here the mean was 150, but the median was only 115. And part of that's because you've got this big number on the edge, this big number here on the outlier that's pulling that weighted average up. This is why uh, if you take macroeconomics and you learn about the, the GDP per capita, the average American is making $60,000 a year, but the median American is probably making somewhere around like $38,000 a year. There's a big significant skew because you've got like billionaires and multimillionaires and things of that nature compared to um, just your average worker making minimum wage. I'm not saying that's the average worker, but there's a lot more people making minimum wage than making a billion dollars. And then when it comes to uh, grade scales and things like that, uh, you can use a weighted mean. So if you, so the same way in which your grade in this class is calculated, where if you get like, if you have 90% on the first exam and 100% on the homeworks and an 88% on the quizzes, based on the weight each category is placed on your overall grade, you can find your weighted percentage in uh, the class manually based on the grades you've gotten. But I try to make it easier on you by putting it in the grading system and the LMS. So for this uh, one, this is how, we how GPA is calculated. So if you've ever wondered how your grade point average is, calculated. So if you're all straight A students, you never have to worry about this because if everything's an A, then everything's a four and everything's name 4.0. But if you don't have all A's or if you've had, don't have all of one of the same grade. So if you had all B's, it'd be 3.0, all C's 2.0, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have that um, relationship, then to calculate your grade point average, you would do the following. So 
Um, so this one is a little bit trickier than the one in your homework. The one in your homework, all of the credits are the same. But in this class, or in this person's uh, transcript, which might be similar if you were taking economics or accounting, which are four credits, and then everything else in business, I think, is three. That one's actually weighted more heavily than the other ones because there's more time associated with it, more tuition you're paying for it, so it's got a higher weight. So this comp class is actually going to be weighted heavier than the other ones. The other ones will be weighted equivalent to each other, but then the comp class is weighted a little bit heavier. Uh, because it's four credits instead of three. So what you do is to get your denominator, you have to add up the number of credit hours that you registered for. So that would be 16 credit hours. So that becomes the denominator. And then your grade has to, in each class has to be converted to this GPA scale. So maybe if you went to like a, in high school, you might've gotten a different weight um, on your Maybe you've got a different weight on your grade point average because of um, because of like honors classes or something like that. Maybe you had a 4.5 or a five point scale. It depends on the school, but this is the more standard scale. So if you get an A, that's a 4.0. So you take four times that four, and then that's worth 16 grade point points. A B is worth three. So this is four, three, three, two, three. So three times three is nine, three times three is nine, three times two is six, three times three is nine. So you add all these together, 16 plus nine is 25. So nine is 34 plus four, or six is 40 plus nine is 49, that goes here. So if you take 49 divided by 16, you end up getting a GPA of 3.1. And then for our class, like let's, so if let's say you had, let's say that something was worth 20%, something's worth 40%, something's worth 20, and something's worth 20. If you wanted to calculate your grade in this class, let's say you got a 100% on this, uh, an 85% on this, a 90 on this, and a 70 on this, okay? The way you calculate your actual grade is you would multiply this, you convert these from percents to decimals, so 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and then you would multiply these times that weight, so this would be 20, this would be 0.4 times 85, so you're multiplying across all these, so 0.4 times 85, is 34, and then 0.2 times 9, B is 18, and then 0.2 times 70, I think it's 16. It's 14, sorry. So then you would add these together. 20 plus 34 is 54, plus 18 is 72, plus 14 is 86. 84, yeah, so you would have an 86% in the class. So that's how you would, you would calculate your, uh, your weighted average in this class. So this is your percentage in the category and this is the weight associated with each category. Add that together, then you get your actual grade. We've already established this, but just again, to find a median, what you have to do is you have to arrange things in ascending order. So finding a median in this table, you can't do it because you have to put them in ascending order so you know which number has half of the observations below it and half of the observations above it. So we would move 27 here, 32 here, 40 here, 67 there, 95 there. You have an odd number, so then these get canceled out and then 40 is your median. Now, 
you may not have an odd number of observations. You may have an even number of observations. If you have an even number of observations, then you have to take the average of the two middle observations. So in this case, you have 40, excuse me, you have four observations. So we took out that 27 value. Well, you have two numbers in the middle. You got 40 and you have 67. To, so to find the median, you split the difference between the two. And whatever number comes in the middle of the two, that becomes your median. So 40 plus 67 is 107 divided by two gives you 53 and a half. Any questions so far? Okay. Mode is the observation that occurs, or excuse me, the value that occurs most often in your data set. If you have all different numbers, then there is no mode. So that salary example we just did, there was no mode. There was a different median from the mean, but there was no mode. The first one we did, there was a mode, median and the mode and the mean were all different. So in this case, uh, three occurs four times, five occurs twice, four occurs once, eight occurs once, and nine occurs once. And that's all our observations since three was observed the most times, three is the mode. You can basically distribute your frequency to help make it easier to find mode and also to create graphs. So if you take the distribution of your frequency and saying, okay, this one occurred this many times, this one occurred this many times, you could create a bar graph from that. That can help you convey your information. Um, you could create different other types of graph based on different types of data that you have. If it's time-based, maybe you want to do a line graph. If you have proportions, you could also do a pie chart. It's just whatever you're comfortable with. So this right-hand side is basically was a running tally of all the observations we had. So we had a bunch of different computers and they had different costs. And so, uh, so every time a thousand came up, we went, one, two, three, four, five. So we had five observations there. 2,000 only came up once. 3,000, one, two, three, four, five. Bam, 4,000 only came up once. 5,000 came up twice. 6,000 came up twice, 7,000 once, 8,000 once, 9,000 once, 10,000 once. The total number of observations that we had is the sum of all of these, which is 11, 12, 14, 16, 20. So we could create a bar graph that shows the specific number of observations of these computer costs, or knowing that we have 20 overall, we could divide the frequency over the sum and determine what percentage of the observations was 1,000. So if we did 5 over 20, that would be 0.25, and then 0.05, 0.25, Point oh five, point one, point one, point oh five for the rest. So you could also convert it to a proportion, so you can actually determine the uh, the percentage of time. So if you were doing going to do a probability type calculation, which is what you do a lot of times in statistics, that's another useful tool that you can glean from this information. So as I mentioned before, you can convert this to a bar graph. So on your vertical axis, it's saying the number of times that computer cost appeared. 
And on the horizontal axis, you actually have the actual price of the computers that were observed. So you could demonstrate it like this. You could just take this information, convert it into this graph. You could have also changed the scale of the vertical axis by making it the percentage of total observations that occurred. So this would be like 25%, 25%, 5%, 5%, 10%, 10%, 5%, 5%, 5%. And you add it all together, you should get one. You should get 100% of the total observations. So 30, 50, 55, 65, 75, wait, excuse me, 25, 30, 55, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, yeah. I understated the contribution of the second thing that was because it's 25%, not 20%. So any questions about this? Uh, here's another bar graph. This is technically what you would call a histogram. So a histogram tells you, oh, a band, gives you a band of, of observations. So instead of here, where you have a bunch of specific singular values, you can bunch together uh, observations within a range. So this is the same data that we had before, but we grouped together all of the computers that were between 1,000 and 3,000. So you had five, five, and one, so that gives you 11. You can group together this one and this one, and that gives you three. You can group together this and this, that gives you three. You can group together this and this, that gives you two. And then anything above it is one. So that's considered a histogram because it's basically creating what are known as bins. And the bins are ranges of values instead of specific numerical values. And that can give you a interpretation of the shape of the data. So in this case, a lot of our computers were between 1,000 and 3,000. And then the higher the, the price, the fewer number of computers that were actually available or sold at that price. A line graph allows for you to see trends over a period of time. So typically what will happen is your vertical axis here will be your uh, data value. And then this will be time. So the horizontal axis will be over time. So you'll usually have years or months or times of days. So if you're measuring weather forecasts, it's hourly. If you're looking at uh, like unemployment statistics, that might be monthly. If you're looking at uh, GDP, that could be annually. Uh, this one is actually by decade. So you have like 2010, 2020, 2030, I guess it was every five years. And then this is just saying what proportion of America's population is over 65. And so the data value that you were interested in is on the vertical axis and then time is on the horizontal axis. You could also have a pie chart. So basically back here, remember how I had distributed this into percentages. So you could presumably convert this. So this would be 25%, 5%, 25%, 5, 10, 10, 5, 5, 5, and 5. You could take the proportion of the total observations and generate a pie chart from that. So if we split this into fourths, then we would have this proportion being 1,000. We would have this proportion be 3,000 we could slice this slice up uh, five ways with 
2000. So this one would be 2000. Then this one would be 4000. Then you have 7,000, 8,000, 9,000. You have another slice here, and then two even slices here. This one becomes 10,000. This one is 5,000. And then do I have any colors of the rainbow left to use? We'll use this darker red and that's 6,000. So by knowing the proportions of the total, you can create a pie chart that is indicative of even proportions relative to the total sum of observation values. So in this example, um, if you wanted to determine what size, what you would do is a circle is 360 degrees. So you'd multiply that times the proportion. So if 25% of your observations are of one value, you'd multiply that times 360 degrees. And that would mean that it would be 90 degrees. So if we look at this, you have a 90 degree angle there. We didn't really talk about geometry in this class, but I would hope that you trust me in that knowing that this is a 90 degree angle, this is a 90 degree angle. So we know that that's correct because it was 25% of the observations, 25% of the observations times 360 gives you 90 degrees. And so this tells you the proportions of survey data. So this one, you've got 6%, 35 and 59 evenly distributed as their appropriate portions of the pie. And then here, 11, 30, and 59. So if you wanted to divvy it up properly, like with a compass, you wanted to manually do it, you could just multiply the proportion times 360, and then that would be the number of degrees that you would contribute to that slice of the pie. Now, uh, Moving on to numbers again, instead of just graphs. Um, this is something that if you end up taking Econ 101 in the future, uh, we'll spend about a week calculating. Indexes are going to, are critical when you're doing economic data because it allows for you to take a large, number of observations or different goods and services in the economy and actually combine them together, determine what the average cost of that is or the current cost of that is versus the time or the amount it costs at some other point in time. And that'll tell you how much more expensive or less expensive things are compared to a different point in time. So uh, right now in the economy, people talk talking a lot about inflation. So it's like somewhere between five and 6%. And so a price index is really how we estimate inflation. We basically create an estimate of how much prices have changed over time. Um, and then we compare that to a previous year. And by doing that calculation, we determine what inflation is, how much have prices gone up over time. So the example below is kind of a, an example of deflation, where say 30 years ago, you wanted to buy not like the fancy TI calculators, which are honestly probably overpriced right now, but like just say a scientific calculator that you could probably get at the bookstore for like 10 bucks. Let's just say you could get it for nine right now. Well, 30 years ago, before computing power exponentially increased, now we have the internet and camera files that are bigger than like the computer processing power of the things that went to the, the spaceships, went to the moon in the 60s. 
uh, they were pretty expensive because it was a game changer for those people to be like, oh, you know what, I could calculate this like that instead of having to write it down with pen and paper. And so back then a calculator cost 75 bucks. So if you wanna know what proportion of the previous value of the calculator is, we're gonna say that 30 years ago was the base year. That is the year in which we're basing the cost on. So 30 years ago, a calculator was 75. Today, it's only nine. So if we take nine divided by 75, that gives us 0.12. If we wanna convert that to a percentage, we multiply it times 100 and we get 12%. What is that 12% telling you? It's saying that a calculator today costs 12% of what a calculator cost 30 years ago. So in a way, it's 88% cheaper now than it was 30 years ago, which is pretty impressive. And nowadays, our calculators are actually really expensive because they're cell phones. And so uh, cell phones, <laughs> It's not the only reason why we have them, but our calculators, our cell phones have become our calculators. So they're actually like $1,000 calculators, not $9 calculators or $75 calculators. So any questions about that? I think I have an example coming up, so we can go over it again. Um, but lastly, I wanted to talk about this measure of dispersion thing. Basically, it's not enough when you get into more detailed statistics to just find what the mean is or find what the median is. Because if we go back to this histogram, clearly the data is skewed. It's not evenly distributed. At, like at the beginning of class, I talked about the bell curve. We're gonna talk about the bell curve in a second again. This is more skewed data in the fact that um, most of your observations that are at a lower value and not a lot of them are at the higher value. So it's not evenly balanced between high values and low values, which we can also observe with the data we already calculated before where we had really high observation, really low observation and our mean was pulled up by that high observation, but our median was substantially lower than the mean and our mode was even lower than that. So the simplest way of measuring dispersion is by finding the range. Hopefully you're comfortable with that. The range is just saying, what is the difference between the highest value that's observed and the lowest value that's observed? So if we look at this data down here, the highest observation I can see is 93.1. The lowest observation I can see is 69.2. So like, let's just say this is like grade distribution on an exam lowest or highest grade is 93.1, lowest is 69.2. All you gotta do is just subtract the lowest from the highest and that tells you the range is 23.9. Now, if this was tests, that would mean that most scores were compressed between a 23.9% range, which is actually not too bad. If the worst person that, the worst grade was a 69 and the highest grade is 93, it's pretty tightly bound and you have a decent distribution of data, but it's all dependent on kind of how big the scale is. In this one, maybe it's zero to 100, so the scale is gonna be dispersed a lot tighter, but if your range is potentially from negative infinity to infinity or even zero to infinity, then you, could, you don't necessarily have a lot of uh, takeaways that you can make from that range calculation unless you've bounded the low and high values. So what is preferred is to calculate something that's known as standard deviation. So what is the standard deviation? It's basically saying, if you have data that we reasonably expect there to be kind of like a central location that's consistent amongst all the observations, meaning the mean is there, the median is there, the mode is there, most observations are around the average, most Median, the median should be around that average as well because it, most of the observations are centered around it. So the standard deviation is saying, if that is true, by what scale and by what range do we have where most of the observations are gonna fall within that boundary? So a standard deviation is saying, okay, if we have the average test score, and we have the range of the test score, 
Well, is that a big range or a small range? And the way you do it is you compare each individual observation to the mean that you calculated, and that gives you an error, or a, basically an error, meaning how far off is the, the average from the actual observed value. Once you found all of those error values, you, you square them, and then you add them together. Uh, the reason why you square them is so that way you get an even number. It's a number line type thing, because you could be like, okay, this the mean is 100, and this observation is 95. So then you end up getting negative 5. And that negative 5 could offset with a positive 5. And in terms of your deviation, they are equivalent. But if you added them together without squaring them, you get 0. And that would be inaccurate. So what you do is you square them. So if you get 95, you had negative 5, you square it, that becomes positive 25, because whenever you square a negative number, it becomes a positive number. Negative times a negative is a positive. So that would be 25. Let's say we get a number, it's 102. So 102 would be minus 100 is 2 squared, so that would be 4. So you'd add the four, you'd add the 25, you'd add all those numbers together, and then you would have the sum of all squared deviations. Then you divide that by the number of observations minus one. You don't need to know why that's the case. Uh, it's some sort of unbiasedness thing that you would learn in a proper statistics class. When you do that, you end up with what's known as the variance. To find standard deviation, you take the square root of the variance, and that will give you your standard deviation. So there are two homework problems with standard deviation. I might, I think I'll put one quiz question up with it. Um, if you don't understand or don't do okay with it, that's okay. Most of the time, what people will do is they'll use statistical packages or Excel to, to do all the calculations for them. Because imagine if you had like a thousand observations, trying to manually do a thousand different observations would take forever. So luckily we've created statistical packages and even Excel and Google Sheets and stuff that can do this with the right code typed in. So I wanna to jump to this graph here, the normal distribution graph. This is in your book as well. This is what the standard deviation is used for. Assuming that we have a normal distribution. So if you have a normal distribution, your mean, your median, and your mode will all be the same because your vertical axis is the percentage of observations. And then this is the actual observed value of those observations. And so the standard deviation is just saying that there, let's say the average is 17. And you calculate the standard deviation to be five. Well, that would mean that if you went, if you subtracted five on this side and you added five on this side, you'd have 12 and you'd have 22. And based on the central limit theorem, that means that 68% of all of your observations should fall between 12 and 22. If you go to two standard deviations, then that would mean between seven and 27, 95% uh, of all of your observations will fall between that. And then if you go to three standard deviations between two and 32, that means that 99.7 of all your observations are there. So the narrower your standard deviation, the more confident you can be that the average that you're calculating is a very strong indicator of the, of the uh, observant in nature reality and value of the statistic that you're trying to calculate. So that's what the standard deviation is doing. So you may get lost in the weeds and be like, I have no idea what I'm calculating. That's what you're trying to calculate. The standard deviation is taking the data, seeing how, how much it varies from observation to observation relative to the actual average that you calculated. If the standard deviation is smaller, 
it means that your graph is going to be tighter in the middle. If it's uh, high, then your graph's going to kind of look like this. And when you're trying to use statistics to make an inference about something or for a business decision or for a policy decision or for a healthcare decision, it's, it would be nice to have this more narrow spread versus a wide one because it could save you money. It can make you feel more confident, more accurate in your decision-making process. And those things can be critical depending upon the circumstances that you have. So here's an example of some observations. So um, we have two different data sets here. So the X is just saying an observation had that value. So we have an obser one observation of one, one observation of two, one observation of five, one observation of 10, one observation of 12. So the first thing we have to do is we have to calculate the average. So we add all those numbers together we get eight, 18, 30, divide that by five, we get six. So now to calculate our standard deviation, we're comparing each individual observation to six. So one minus six is minus five. We have to square that. Negative five times negative five becomes 25. Two minus six is negative four, square that, that's 16. Five minus six is pretty close. You're only off by one, so square that, that's only one. 10 minus six is four, square that, that's 16. 12 minus six, you square that, that's 36. So the sum of your, de sum of your residuals is 94. You then have to divide that by the number of observations minus one. So five minus one is four. So 94 divided by four gives you 23 and a half. This is known as your variance. To find the standard deviation, you take the square root of that number. So the square root of 23.5 is 4.8. So the standard deviation of this data is 4.8. How does that apply to this? Well, assuming that this, this data was normally distributed, which it might not have been, what that standard, if the mean was, six, that means six is right here. Oops. Six is right there in the middle, smack dab in the middle. Oops. There we go. If your standard deviation is 4.8, that means one standard deviation would be 1.2 and this would be 10.8. That means 68% of the observations are between 1.2 and 10.8. Well, uh, this that means that between here and here, most of your observations are in there. And look at that, three out of the five. So about 60% of them are. So it's not too far off. If we add this, so if we go out another 4.8, we're at like negative 2.4 something like that. And then here we're at 15. And so 95% of the observations are between there and there. So, I mean, all of our observations are between there and there. So we would reasonably expect that. Now, what about the second set of data? Well, in this one, we have two observations of four, one observation of five, one observation of eight, one observation of nine. So if you add all that together, get eight, 13, 21, 30, divide that by five, we get six. So notice how different the observations are. You've got a bunch of low ones, a couple of high ones. There's really only one observation that's even close to six over here. Meanwhile, here you get the same. There are no observations that are six, but you have a lot that are close. So let's see how that affects the standard deviation. Well, four minus six is negative two. Square that, that's four. Again four off by one, one, two squared is four, three squared is nine. So you add all this together, you get eight, nine, 12, or excuse me, eight, nine, 13, 22. So 22 is your square of your residuals. Sum of squared residuals, divide that by n minus one to get your variance. That becomes five and a half. 
take the square root of five and a half, that becomes 2.3. So data set B has a narrower deviation, which is gonna be a lot easier in terms of our analysis. Compared to the other one, we're already in the negative numbers and we still haven't even covered 99% of the data yet. If we compare our average, we had six again. If we add 2.3 to that, we get 8.3, we get 4.7. We subtract 2.3 again, we get 2.4 and 11, or excuse me, 10.6. Then here we get 0 0.1 and 12.9. Well, Notice this range here is only 12.8. The other one, the range was, I think, somewhere around like 23. So all of our observations are falling in a smaller range, which is gonna give us more accuracy with our predictions if we're utilizing mean. So again, step one is to take the average. Step two is to take the difference between the, each individual observation and the average, subtract the two, square it, add the squares together, divide that by n minus one observations, take the square root of that, that's your standard deviation. So even if you have the same mean, you're not gonna have the same standard deviation. It depends on the observations that you have and what their values are individually relative to that mean. So does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so let's uh, do a couple examples here. So if we wanna calculate the mean, you just add all these together. So we get 12, 14, 25, 25 divided by four, because you had four observations, that's 6.25. If you want to find the median from this set of data, we need to organize them in ascending order. So 10 is our smallest, then 19, then 25, then 38, then 55, then 100. We have six observations here, so we can't just take the middle number and say that's the median. We have to take the two middle numbers, make sure there's even number of observations on either side of the two middle numbers you chose. Then we take the average of them. So 25 plus 38 becomes 63. Divide that by two, you get 31 and a half as the median. So it's literally the midpoint essentially of the, excuse me, it's the midpoint of the observations like that. Find the mode, you just have to find the most frequently observed thing. So we see 22 is observed once, 19 is observed once, 15 is observed once, 16 is observed once, 18 is observed three times, five, five is observed once. So that means your mode is 18 because it occurred the most frequently. So this one, we want to do a price index. So we want to figure out how much more expensive the truck is in 2012 versus 2008. So we take the price in the current year of 2012, divide that by the base year price of 2008. So we do 30,000 divided by 21,000, that gives you point, or excuse me, 1.429. Multiply that times 100, you get the 142.9. So that means that the truck in 2012 is 142.9% of what it cost in 2008. Although I wouldn't prefer not that, I prefer for that percentage to not be there. 
because then you can be like, okay, well, it's 42.9% higher than it was in 2008. That's really what that's telling you. Because if it was 100%, then it would be the same price because you'd be dividing by the same number. If you wanted to determine how many degrees on a pie chart you would need, uh, you would just multiply the purport, convert the percentages to decimal points, and then multiply that times 360. So 360 times 0.42 would give you 151.2. 360 times 0.51 would give you 183.6 and 360 times 0.07 would give you 25.2 degrees. So if you wanted, like I said, so this would basically be saying, okay, if I wanted to make a pie chart, how many degrees of this? That's not a very round circle, but then it would be okay, well, 151 degrees, and 183 degrees and 25. So this would be no watch. This would be traditional watch and this would be digital watch. So does anybody have any questions?